me, I missed being live. And today I am here to do a live demo for you on a new quilt block. It's kind of a variation on one that I did years ago using my 10 inch slicer ruler, this guy here. I designed this ruler back in 2015. So there's thousands of you out there who already have it. So if you're looking for a new project, a new quilt block or a new quilt design that you can whip up in no time, definitely keep watching this live stream because I'm going to walk you through step by step on a couple different things. One is how to make the block. Block. This is what I'm calling my vase shaped block. It kind of looks like a vase. I have a couple vases that are this shape and I think it's just a fun geometric cool looking block that is a great scrap buster. Now my ruler is designed to be used with 10 inch by 10 inch square pieces of fabric and if you've ever purchased one of those pre-cut stacks you know exactly what I'm talking about. Depending on the fabric manufacturer you'll hear them called 10 by 10 tiles or a layer cake, there's different names for them depending on the manufacturer. There are 10 inch by 10 inch square pieces of fabric that we start off with, but a lot of times people don't realize that they can cut their own squares from yardage. And so that's what I'm gonna be doing today. So I'll share with you some cutting tips on how to cut from yardage your 10 inch squares so that then if you wanted to make like a two, uh, a two fabric quilt, you can. It would look cool, I think in neutrals too, and blacks and whites, that would look really awesome. So you can see that they're the same fabrics, they've just been inverted. So where the yellow is in the center here and the blue floral is on the sides, I have the opposite here. And this is kind of what the trend is with my ruler. Now I designed the 10 inch slicer again, like I said, to be used with 10 inch square pieces of fabric. And the whole point was, that you are able to make different types of quilt blocks with minimal to like no waste at all, okay? Instead of just, I think, making a quilt that's just a bunch of squares sewn together is cool, but if you're wanting to add more uh, of a geometric shape, a secondary or tertiary design, depending on how you're folding and cutting your fabrics, definitely check out my 10 inch slicer ruler. I have a full video library of different ways that you can use this ruler to make different quilt blocks and even some zipper pouch projects. Now, if you don't have one, the link is in the description box below. We do have them in stock, so you can check them out there. Let's go ahead and put my face in a bubble and give y'all the over my shoulder shot so we can jump right into our project. Welcome everybody. Hi, Teresa tuning in from Utah. We got Marilyn tuning in from Melbourne, Florida. Howdy, Florida neighbor. I'm coming to you all from my home sewing studio here in North Central Florida where it is raining and has been raining every day for the past month and a half. <laughs> I'm kind of over it already. I'm, I'm looking forward to a little bit more sun uh, so that my seedlings can keep growing because I am in full fall garden prep mode. All right, so let's see. Oh, Amanda says she has both my 10 inch slicer and the five inch slicer. She loves them. Thank you, Amanda, I love that. Hi Liz, tuning in from the UK and Kay tuning in from Jacksonville, Florida. All right, so check out the block here. These two blocks were made using one 10 inch by 10 inch square piece of fabric from the yellow fabric and the same from this one. So if you have squares that are the same, you can still get two blocks, but they're swapped like this. Now, of course, if you have scraps and you can cut your scraps down into 10 inch squares, you can make a really cool scrappy quilt that just features different pieces, different prints, solids, a mix. And uh, another good idea for this, because we have such a large section in the center here, is if you make a lot of kid quilts or baby quilts, this would be cool for ice by, which is like having fun little um, novelty fabrics that have like little characters and little ladybugs and alligators or whatever, because you're not chopping up your fabric pieces into such small pieces where you kind of take away from the design of the fabric. So you have a good blank canvas right here in the center of these blocks. All right, so let's set these aside. Remember that I will be using my 10 inch slicer ruler to make this vase shaped block today. And the link for that is in the description uh, box below or here on, fa on Facebook. Also, we'll put it in the chat for y'all. Okay, so I'm going to move this aside because I'm going to give y'all my tips and show you how I like to cut 10 inch by 10 inch square pieces from yardage. Okay, sometimes those pre-cut squares can be pricey because they have to be cut in the U.S. even if the fabric is um, printed overseas. I'm trying to find what's the straightest side here, even though I'm going to trim off a little bit. So the way that I like to do it is, and I hope, okay, that's a good enough shot. You can see most of the fabric there. So the fabric is folded the same way it comes off the bolt. Okay. I haven't done anything to it. So the selvages should be parallel to each other. And then I have a fold down here. What I typically do, especially if it's, I'm pulling out fabric from my stash that has been kind of folded for a long time. I usually will, um, spray it either with starch or with some water and then hit it with an iron just to kind of unwrinkle it up, right? Make it nice and flat. And then I will pick up my fabric like this. Y'all can probably see this in my bubble picture. 
And I don't go one way or the other. I kind of let the fabric hang so that when I place it down, I don't have these kind of streaks and skewing, right? These drag lines in my fabric. I want the fabric to tell me where it wants to fall so that I can drop it as close to being on grain as possible. And this is going to be a little tricky to do with this one because it does have, I got something in my eye, because it does have already a folded crease there since it just came off the bolt. But this is the idea. You go like this and then drop it on itself. It should be nice and smooth. And then I will line this up so that the fold is closest to my body and I know now the fold is a straight edge. So whenever we cut with our ruler, let me find my long strip ruler here, this guy. I always like to have a six inch by 24 inch ruler. This is great for cutting strips and for stuff like this, cutting your own strips down to a specific width and then sub cutting them down to get whatever Patrick pieces you need. So because my fold line here, and y'all can kind of see the fold line. Let me try and pull this up a little bit more. Okay, so my fold line, once I have it dropped flat on itself and I don't have any drag lines, everything is nice and smooth, I'm gonna use this straight line here at the fold as a straight edge to measure on my ruler. So I basically take any straight line on my ruler, place it on the fold, and that means that if this is straight, then this edge, which I'm next going to use to cut, is gonna be straight also. So I'm just sliding it over, and I can see I have a little bit of fabric here and almost a half inch up top, so that means that that edge is off. So you want to clean it up and remember for cutting, whenever you're cutting a long uh, length like this, I go with my rotary cutter just about to where my fingers are, like halfway up the ruler. Then I will stop cutting, walk my fingers up more so that I can steady the top half of the ruler and then I continue cutting. Notice I always remove the excess that I've cut away first before getting rid of my ruler because sometimes if you didn't apply downward pressure the entire length of the way, you might have cut a bit and then left a little bit stuck and cut another bit. And before you move the ruler, you would easily be able to go back and get the bit that you missed without having to waste more fabric, scoot your ruler over and make a whole new fresh cut. Okay, so those are just some cutting tips. All right. Hi, Rosa. She's tuning in from Connecticut. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. All right. So I've cleaned off this edge. This should be straight. My fold line is, is nice and straight. And then I'm going to measure 10 inches over because I want to cut 10 inch by 10 inch squares. So I'm going to use my five inch by 10 inch ruler. Again, the long one is going to span the whole height here of my strip. And this ruler is 10 inches. This is one of my rulers that measures five by 10. So I know from uh, from beginning to end of the ruler is exactly the 10 inches that I want it to be. Now, some of you may find this cutting technique a little bit odd, but I always like to share it because sometimes I find that people have never tried this before and it works. It works for me and this is how I like to do it. So I don't put those grippy things on my rulers. A lot of times people like to put them so that their ruler doesn't move on them when they're cutting. However, for me, I don't seem to have a problem with rulers moving on me. I tend to have big hands and I put a lot of pressure down. So instead, I like my rulers to be slick because this right here. I have it measured at 10 inches here, but how can I make sure that this up here is also 10 inches? Well, I need to get the ruler up there. And so what I do is slide. And as I slide up, I'm keeping it flush with this ruler and I can see that now I'm short here. And so this allows me to make really small movements to make sure that this is exactly perfect. And I mean, I moved it there maybe 1 32nd of an inch. It was barely anything. But this is how I like to do it so that I make sure I have super precise cuts. So notice, I go all the way up, all the way down, sliding, and I know that it measures 10 inches the full length, okay? Now I'm gonna remove that ruler which I used to measure, and now I'm just gonna follow the side edge here of my long strip ruler, and this is exactly 10 inches, all right? So that's how I do it. And you would continue to cut more, right, if you were cutting a bunch of squares from there. Oh, uh, Nubian Roxana says, I love this cutting technique and also use the grips. That's awesome that you can, you know, go back and forth based on when you need it, right? Okay, so now I'm going to get rid of my selvage edges, which is this here. And you can use any ruler, right? This one is going to be 10 inches, so that would work as well. I have this one here. And I always like to, when I tell people to cut away the selvages, sometimes I have students go like this, like, okay, 
I'm going to cut the selvage. Yeah, but you're also wasting like an inch and a half of fabric. I would hate for you to get further down into whatever pieces you're sub cutting. And then you're like three quarters of an inch short. And you're like, ah, you can't really add it back, right? So when you're trimming away selvages, try to be as efficient as possible and waste the least amount that you can. So I'm only coming over about an eighth of an inch beyond the selvage. Of course, make sure on the back that you're catching both layers. So you cut both selvages at once. So I get rid of that. And I always just give it a quick look over just to make sure that I don't have any selvage bits of the white strip on the backside. Great. So I've trimmed away my selvages and now I'm going to cut this down into 10 inch squares. So this was a 10 inch strip. Now I'm leaving it folded because if you're working with, um, quilting cottons and especially like designer quality quilting cottons most of your fabric is going to be between 40 to 44 sometimes 45 inches wide so if we divide 45 by 10 i know that i can at least get four full 10 inch increments so i don't need to open this up right i can just use a bigger ruler here place the 10 inch mark on this edge and then i'm just going to come 10 inches over and i know that the square that is underneath my ruler here is 10 inches by 10 inches. And because my strip is folded, I cut two squares at once, right? So these are all different little kind of tips and things that you start to do once you get into cutting a lot of Patrick pieces out. If you make a lot of quilts, you already knew this. All right, so I'm gonna do it again. So two, and then I'm gonna cut two more and I'm left with a couple inches left over. Make sure everything is nice and straight. So this is what I have left over. You can use that for a little pouch, zipper pouch project later, or Patrick tote bag or something. And then we have cut from that one 10 inch strip by the width of the fabric, four squares, right? So you would continue to do this for however many squares you needed for the size quilt that you wanted to make. So now I'm gonna take my 10 inch slicer ruler. Where are you? Here it is. And I'm gonna show you how I prep the fabric squares to cut them so that we can make this quilt block. All right, and I'm gonna grab my Mortelli roundabout mat here, which is currently still out of stock. As soon as we get them back in stock, um, from my distributor, I will post it up for sale. I know maybe there's like 20 of you on the wait list, but I love this. It's a rotating cutting mat with the pressing mat underneath and then underneath is the, the rotating. So you can use it both for pressing, for cutting, all right? Here we're gonna use it for both and it allows me to do both in a small space here on the camera. All right, I'm gonna keep looking at the chat to make sure I don't have any specific questions. If I see that it's a question that applies to what I'm doing, I will try and pop over and answer it for y'all. But right now, take a moment if you are enjoying this live demo on how to make my vase-shaped quilt block using the Crafty Gemini 10-inch uh, slicer ruler. Give this video a thumbs up, whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube. If you're not already subscribed on YouTube, click the subscribe button and the bell notification. That will let you know every time I post a new video for you. Okay, so here is the square. I'm gonna kickstart my iron right quick. And we're gonna fold this in half and then in half again. That's gonna be the prep pressing to then cut. And that's what's gonna give us this symmetrical cut for the center piece. Now what we have left over as the off cuts actually ends up being the side panels. So you'll see how we can use a 10 inch slicer to make these two cuts and not have virtually any waste. All right, so I'm gonna fold this in half making sure if you cut precisely, you want to make sure that the, the top edges match and so do the sides. And I'm going to zoom in just a hair. It is pouring here. Can y'all hear that? Let's hope that the power stays on. Welcome to Florida. Okay, so I'm going to press here. And where is my clapper? Here it is. Wooden Taylor's clapper. If you're a quilter and you don't yet have one of these, if you sew anything and you don't yet have one of these, definitely head on over to my shop and grab one. I'm going to press that half seam, the fold that I just did, and I'm going to put my Taylor's clapper on it. This wooden uh, tool is just a chunk of wood, right? It helps kind of absorb the heat from the iron and it helps set that crease really, really nicely at the same time. So for hems, for Patrick pieces, or anytime you're using a template and you and it requires you to fold and fold like I'm doing here, if you all were in my clammy quilt club, you all know that we use the clapper to set creases to get different cuts with that clammy ruler. So this is folded in half and pressed. Now I'm gonna fold it in half again. If you want to, you can fold from left to right if you fold it in kind of the same orientation that I did. The point is going to be, and I'll show you in a second, again, make sure it matches down here along the folds, here and here, and then I'm gonna press along this center fold again and hit it with the clapper. 
So the key thing is going to be how you orient this folded up square piece of fabric when you go to cut. All right, so that looks good. And you would just do all the prep work, right? Take all your squares, fold and fold and press, press, set them aside and just make yourself a big stack. That way you can kind of crank through this assembly style, assembly line style. All right, so here's the key thing for this. Orient it so you have a fold going along the, the left and your two folds going along the bottom. So think of a capital letter L, if you're reading it and orienting it correctly, capital letter L should be all folds. In other words, the opposite two sides should be raw edges. Okay, and I'm orienting it or orienting it this way because I'm right-handed. Next up, so fold and fold, I'm going to take my 10-inch slicer and I'm going to line it up like this so that the narrow edge is closest to my body, the widest is at the top, and you have it facing up so you can see the numbers and it's reading, you know, you should be looking at the right side of it, not the backwards numbers, so that you have a 90-degree angle, okay, down here and here, and we're going to line it up along the side edge and along the bottom. Make sense? And then I'm going to follow this kind of asymmetrical edge of the template and slice right through. Okay? So here's what we get. We have made one cut into the one double folded up square piece of fabric. When I open this up, I get the center chunk of my vase, right? And then these guys are two separate side panel pieces. Okay, so you can see what I end up with from the one 10 inch by 10 inch square. You should have three different cuts. Now, we're obviously not going to sew these back together because you wouldn't even be able to tell it was a quilt block, right? We want some contrast. So what you would do is sew in side panels that were left over from other fabric cuts, and then your finished block would look like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So I have my centerpiece here. Let's go ahead and grab a yellow square. We'll prep it and cut it the exact same way. That way we get a little repetition in here for y'all. So I have my square. I fold in half first. Make sure everything is aligned. Oh, Karen says it's getting uh, pretty dark there. Yeah, it's pouring here, like raining cats and dogs. All right, so one fold is down. Fold the other way. Amanda says, I have the clapper tool, as you can as you can tell, your store is my favorite. I love to hear it. <laughs> Thanks for supporting our online shop, Amanda. Awesome. Margie says, I love it, no waste. That's right, so let me show you, because right here I'm going to show you exactly what you get. And this is just from cutting the squares out of two fabrics. Remember, you can cut them out of 10, 12, if you have an entire collection, if you have a half yard bundle, a full yard bundle. Chop all that yardage up and make your own pre-cut squares, and then you can play a fun swapping game and move things around. So again, I'm checking a fold here, folds here. Orient my ruler so that the narrow edge is closest to me, and I'm using that 90-degree angle here. Cut. I have my center chunk and my two side panels. So this is what I mean by playing a swapping game and having virtually no waste. These are the three pieces I got from this square. These were the three pieces I got from this one. And all I have to do is swap out the side panels. So I'll take the side panels from this square we just cut and give it to this vase. And take the side panels from the one we previously cut and put it to this one. So I'm still using the same amount of fabric. I'm just ending up with quilt blocks that look a lot more visually appealing, I think. Um, by swapping it out and making these kind of angled cuts. All right, so now let's go ahead and share with you how you would prep these to sew it up. Because you might be thinking, uh-oh, there's a weird angle there, there's kind of a pivot point. So it's pretty easy. I mean, it might take you one block to get the hang of it, but I think after that you'll be good to go. The key is to take it one section of this full seam at a time, okay? Thank you, Joan. She says, hello from California. I love watching you. You're so talented. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Hi from Mississippi. Wow, Rita says she's making strawberry fig preserves while she's watching me. That sounds delish. Okay, I'm going to scoot this up so y'all can see a little better. And I'll end up moving the camera angle this way now when I take out the sewing machine. But I want to talk a little bit about the pins. So 
I rarely pin my patchwork, but when you have something like this, where you have this, this, this quick pivot point, you do want to have a pin there. And this is where that clapper also helps because remember we use it to set the seam. And so we have really hard creases that we can easily see. So now what I want you to do is obviously orient the three pieces of the block pretty side facing up. So you see how they're going to look once they're sewn together. Then I want you to take this halfway point here with this halfway mark. You can see because it's exactly where this changes direction, the same thing for this, and you're gonna place one on top of the other, pretty sides touching, and place a pin right there where they should intersect. Because we know, regardless of what we do here or here, we have to hit this spot spot on, otherwise we won't get the correct kind of change of direction that we need to have the block turn out right, okay? So I just do one side at a time and I'll just put one pin there. That's it. So now when it comes to sewing, before I pull out the sewing machine, I'm going to walk you through just so you see how you'd have to orient it. All right, here we go. I want to take on this section first. So forget about what's on the bottom half, literally, like pretend it's not there. That pin is holding your fabric. Don't fight it. Just work with what's above it. So I would take this and I would pivot it from that point, okay? And you can see that then it falls right there. And if you're an eighth of an inch, you're gonna be about an eighth to a quarter of an inch down. Let me see if y'all can see that. And I'm gonna start bringing it down because I know um, I'm gonna set up my sewing machine next. Right here. Y'all see that little bit? If you're just a little bit off, don't pull it and distort it because remember, it's cut along an angle. So it's not a true bias, but it is gonna distort and stretch if you yank it. Don't worry about it. If it's an eight to a quarter of an inch off, just have it fall where it wants to. And now you can see it's gonna be pretty easy to sew straight. If you can sew straight, you can do this, right? From here to here, and I want to try and stop with the needle down into the quilt block right where the pin is at that intersecting point. Very important to make sure your sewing machine stops with the needle down. If it's up, you're gonna get a jump and a bobble and it's not gonna hold that stark pivot point that we need to end up with the, the, the finished look of that block, okay? So I'm gonna zoom out. Okay, and I'm gonna start. Again, I only put the pin in the center there. If you want to, like after you orient and you find that it lies flat, you can put a couple pins if you find that that makes it a little bit easier for you to hold. But make sure I don't have any bubbles up here. I'm going to start at the top with a scant quarter inch. And I've already set my machine so that the needle is a quarter of an inch to the left of the edge of my presser foot. So I'm going to put presser foot down. And I'm going to sink my needle down and then I'm just going to sew. And I like to sew a scant quarter inch, which just means like a skinny quarter inch. You're a couple threads uh, shy of hitting a true quarter inch. As long as you're consistent with this block, it'll work out though. You know, if you sew a chunky quarter inch or you're using a quarter inch foot, whatever of that is fine. So now as I approach this pinning point here that we marked, you can grab this bottom piece and just straighten it out a little bit if you find that that helps you see the straight edge there. So now as I approach this, remember, we never want to sew over pins, but I'm going to come all the way to where the pin is, take that last stitch and stop, my needle is down, and remove your pin, okay? Now the needle is holding the spot that the pin was, so we can now lift up our presser foot and swing this bottom edge, right? So now we forget about the top half. We've already sewn it. We're over it. The only thing you want to make sure here is that you don't sew a bubble into your seam. So just grab it. Try not to pull this way, but you can definitely feel free to tug this way to the right. Okay. I'm going to line up the edge and sometimes it's tricky and it might look like you have a bubble there, but that's because your presser foot is up. So the fabric is kind of floating there. So remember to put the presser foot down first, have a look. You can grab, um, I folded the fabric a bit, so I'm going to grab my seam ripper real quick, and I'm just going to straighten it out. I don't want the fabric folded. There we go. So once it's flat, that's it. Put the presser foot down. Your needle is in the right position. So now I stitch a little bit, stop again, and now I can, you know, take my time to adjust this last bit. All right, so my edges match up, and I keep sewing. 
nice and straight. So it's just a matter of slowing down, making sure that that presser foot is down and in your project. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side so we can, again, do a little bit of repetition here and help you all remember those steps. Then we'll talk about pressing it and how you want it to lie flat because of that uh, it, peak there, that little intersecting point. So again, opposite side. Forget about this for now. Place it the way it's supposed to be. Fold one on top of the other. Grab a pin. Insert it right at that intersecting point. And I like to take my time to be spot on with that, okay? Then again, we're sewing this first bit. And forget about the bottom half. And once you get to this point, forget about the top half and focus on the bottom. They're both straight seams, so it's just about, uh, about making that transition at that pivot point, okay? Let's see. Jackie says, I think I'll have to order this ruler. I have one more granddaughter that's turning seven, so I'll be getting her a quilt for Christmas this year. That's awesome. Yeah, these types of quilts, I mean, if you have pre-cut squares or if you're cutting your own, if you have scraps, if you have leftover, you know, fat quarters obviously wouldn't be the most efficient cut because... You can get two one way, but um, not quite two in the other direction of it. But half yard cuts, one yard cuts, all of that would work great. So again, as you approach this intersection, slow down and stop with the needle in. I'm going to get as close as I can. I'm actually going to pull the pin out. My needle is still up, so I don't want to do anything yet, but sink that needle into my project. Boom. Now the needle's in. And notice, I had to press a button to get the needle to go down on this machine. If you have a vintage machine or one that's not computerized and is just manual, all you have to do is stop a little bit shy of your spot and then turn the hand wheel towards you to take manual stitches. And that's the best way to get super precise, right? Because on some of those machines, when you let go of, your, of the foot pedal, it can either stop with the needle up, halfway down, you, you can go past your point, and you don't want to do that because you do have the metal of the pin in place. So again, my needle is in. I lifted up my presser foot. I'm going to get that fabric out of my way. Put my presser foot back down. Take a couple of stitches just so I can get me started. Stop with the needle in, and then now I'm going to fix this edge and line everything up so I can just whoop, stitch straight right past this. And I'm kind of at a twisted angle here so, so that y'all can see it. But you know what I mean. Just take your time and make sure that it's nice and straight. And this is just one of the blocks that you can make with my 10-inch slicer. If you're new to my rulers, uh, I have a video library. If you just go to craftygemini.com, I put the link in the YouTube video too. It's just craftygemini.com slash 10 inch spelled out i-n-c-h slicer and you just scroll down so if you have 10 inch squares or you take some time to pre-cut your own you go to that page and you literally just scroll down until you find a quilt block or a project that you like that features my ruler with the 10 inch squares and boom you can start watching the video you can slow it down rewind it rewatch it all of that so when you get my rulers you don't have to buy individual patterns to go with them you get that free video library that's archived there for you to access whenever okay awesome Okay, let's see. Did I miss a question here? Oh, Rosa says it reminds her of the same technique that we used to put in the side panels on the Vega project bag. It does, just because it's not just a straight seam, but it requires you either on curves or a pivot point to match up those kind of registration marks, right? They need to match up exactly at that point, and then you just sew to get there and sew beyond it, and that's how you can get that done. All right, so let me grab my pressing mat here real quick. And so now you can see what we're working with here. So this, some tips for this. First, I like to, especially when I'm sewing patchwork, I like to press my seams the same way they were sewn. And because this is an awkward angle, you see that even as you lay it down, like it wants to flop open, which is fine. But again, do the same thing you did sewing. Hold it, worry about one edge first. And then I'm going to kind of just turn this that way so that I can make this top edge flat and do the same thing. So you just have to give it a little press. I'm going to hit it with the clapper in a second after I press the seams out, but just so you all can see. Again, you don't want to just go like this and hit this flat, okay? Because you have that change of direction, you have to make sure that you're just working one side up to the middle, stop, flip this up, and just work that back half of this one, all right? Now, I like to, on these blocks, because the side panels are narrower than the center, I'm going to press my seam allowances out. In this case, out means that I'm pressing to the dark fabric. But on these blocks, where's the other one? 
Do, do, do. On this one, the outside or the side panels here are the lighter fabric, which is fine. I still like to press them towards that way because the chunkier piece here, I find like it lies flat when I do that. So I press my seams to the outside or side panels. And notice what I do with my left hand. I'm kind of tugging on the fabric here. Have you ever pressed Patrick pieces where the fabric rolls like this and it's bubbled up and you don't kind of spread the two fabrics aside to give it a good press and you get like a crease and then you wonder, well, I did the exact same things and I'm pretty confident in my seam allowances, but one looks smaller than the other. And oftentimes that happens because you get a bit of fabric that's rolled in there and when you press it flat, it lies flat and it looks right. But if you grab the edge and kind of open it and tug it out you'll see that you've lost maybe an eighth of an inch or a quarter inch or, or more right if you don't do that so again I tug on it lightly start with the tip of my uh, iron right there and then I hit it with the clapper to help set those seams okay all right okay so look at that how crisp and flat does that look other side again one side at a time here and this one and remember that I use my 10 inch slicer ruler I designed this ruler six years ago so if you're kind of new to the crafty Gemini new to my videos you may not have heard of it but I think this is a fun little demo and a fun block to do I'm trying to whip up a couple more quilts so that I can work on some long arm quilting videos for y'all on my handy quilter moxie without having them be like huge quilts that will take forever but I'm just trying to put some together so that they can be kind of instructional on setting up your um, quilt sandwiches and stuff on the long arm okay so now did anybody notice that I have not taken the rotary cutter since I cut my pieces and if we have a look at the block I mean that's pretty spot-on there's really nothing that I have to trim you may end up with say if your fabric uh, moved on you a little bit when you folded it the prep step for cutting you may find that you need to just take a ruler which is cool because my um, 10 inch slicer has a big 90 degree angle here that I often will use to trim up the blocks themselves instead of having to grab a whole nother one. So here I can see that I have that little teensy bit to trim up, but that's it. This is what I mean by I designed this ruler to be used with 10 inch, uh, 10 inch by 10 inch pre-cut squares of fabric so that you end up with these cool looking blocks with no waste, okay? Now, real quick, because this always comes up when I'm doing stuff with the 10 inch slicer. The block does not measure 10 inches by 10 inches, obviously, right? We sewed two seams in and we ate up a quarter inch here and a quarter inch here. So the height, we haven't sewn any seams that run horizontally on the block. So the height still measures the 10 inches from the original square fabric, okay? So this is just kind of design work here so you can, you know, Stop and pay attention to what exactly it is that you did and how it affected the fabric pieces. So from top to bottom, we have no seams that were sewn horizontally. This still measures 10 inches. However, the side seams did get sewn in, so we ate some of the fabric in this direction, meaning your block is now a rectangle. It's narrower than it is taller, and it's about 9 inches this way. Okay, because we ate up a quarter inch and a quarter inch, that's half an inch. Quarter inch and a quarter inch, that's half an inch. Half an inch plus half an inch is one inch from the original piece. So do you see how that equals nine inches now? And if you're consistent with your cuts and you're folding precisely and you sew, you really don't even have to trim up or lose anything. That's what I mean by no waste. You make a ton of these blocks, you'll end up with blocks that all measure nine inches by 10 inches. And it's kind of cool because even if you just sewed them up together side by side, you would just end up with a quilt that is slightly narrower than it is longer, which is typically how we make our quilts, right? Rectangles anyway. So sometimes I get people who are like, it just bothers them to have a rectangular block and they feel like they need to trim it down. You always can do that. You know, you can trim it down to nine inches by nine inches, but I feel like it's a waste of fabric because you're losing fabric that you could easily leave in for the overall design and the finished length of the quilt. So just keep that in mind. All right, so Barbara's asking, where can I get the rulers you made? So you can find our rulers at craftygemini.com slash shop. We've included links for you to take you directly to the product page in um, or on our, on our Facebook chat here, as well as in the description box of the YouTube video, okay? But also, if you just go to Google and type in Crafty Gemini Slicer, my five inch slicer, which is the little guy, the little brother to this one, Five inch slicer will pop up, the 10 inch slicer will pop up, as well as um, my five inch by 10 inch ruler is another one that I use a lot for cutting and subcutting my fabrics, okay? So you can find all my rulers anytime you're looking for something that I've done or a product that I sell or a video I've done, 
just use the words crafty Gemini followed by whatever it is you're looking for and it literally will be the first or second thing that pops up for you on Google okay yes so the rulers are available we have them and they are made in the US okay I have them made here um, in the US so we have them in stock we don't have to worry about restocking or anything like that okay Jackie's asking, do you plan to use sashing between the blocks? Now that would be great. Think about what you could do because, okay, we're talking about one block at a time, but look what happens. And this is what I mean when I mention like secondary or tertiary designs. When we put two blocks side by side, and these just happen to be identical blocks. Can you see how now you've created this diamond shape in the center? So if you think about that, prior to cutting and putting your stuff together, you really could end up with something really cool because you can think about, well, what fabric is gonna be here? Do I want these two side panels of each block to match or do I want them to be color blocked? For example, if I take two opposite blocks and sew them side by side, now look what I get here. And I can see that being done with like uh, neutrals, like black, whites, grays, like a really grayscale quilt. I think that would look awesome. If you used really bright solids, can you imagine every color that goes side by side that matches up here? I mean, that quilt would just sing, right? So there's a lot of things that you can do. I'm all about giving y'all the space to get creative, use up your scraps, and put quilts together that are just more than solid squares, you know? Like, that's cool you know, one block like this next to another one. That's a great beginner quilt, especially when I'm teaching like kids and stuff. You know, you just make like the basic 10 inch squares. But if you can take the exact same amount of fabric, chop it up, sew it back together without wasting any of the fabric and get a cool design, I'm all for it, okay? So I hope that you all enjoyed this demo. Let me just pop in here, see if I have any other remaining questions. Awesome. Vicky says she has both of my rulers. Yeah, they've been around for a while, so I think a lot of you have them. And I kind of every once in a while like to pop back in with a demo and share with you yet a different way to use the rulers. Because sometimes we buy things, maybe you made a quilt with it three years ago, and hopefully this demo will kind of boost that inspiration and get you to take your ruler back out, especially if you are looking to get your quilting sojo back. Just cut up some pieces. You don't, nobody says you have to make the quilt today, right? But work on a block or two and you might find that that kind of gets the ball rolling again. All right? So I'm so glad Virginia says I love this. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in for Whip Wednesday number 39 today. Remember, you can get the ruler in our online shop, craftygemini.com slash shop. I also have a full video library of different uses for the same ruler. So you're getting really good bang for your buck. Um, if you enjoyed the video, hit it with the thumbs up, share it with your crafty friends, especially if you have any new or beginning quilters. This would be a great way to get them started. And I will see y'all next Wednesday for another episode of Whip Wednesday. Have a good rest of your week and I'll see y'all later. Bye. For the same ruler. So you're getting really good bang for your buck. Um, if you enjoyed the video, hit it with the thumbs up, share it with your crafty friends, especially if you have any new or beginning quilters. This would be a great way to get them started. And I will see y'all next Wednesday for another episode of